South Florida. This is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Hi there and welcome to Headliners. I'm Lauren Pastrana. Only on CBS News Miami, we have more on the unrest in Haiti as we continue to follow the developments there. We were there for a mission to get supplies into Haiti, a process that's been paralyzed because of the ongoing crisis and violence. The mission flight brought people into Haiti along with thousands of pounds of supplies. CBS News Miami's Tanya Francois was the only journalist allowed on the flight. Our flight took off at 6.30 yesterday morning on board myself and three others. They were headed back to Haiti, their home, with thousands of pounds of supplies needed to help service the hundreds of missions and missionaries in the country. And next, Soufrance has been waiting for weeks to get back to seminary school in the United States. I came to see my family, um, my mom, my friends, some orphans we have at an orphanage center. And when I had to return, like I had some American friends, came, I mean, who came with me. So due to the problem, the situation of the country, so I could not go back together with them. He's not alone. For one Haitian mom, this flight is a welcome doctor's visit for her toddler. So why are you leaving? Okay, my baby boy has an appointment with his pediatrician. Many Haitians and Americans have been stuck in Haiti since gangs took over 80 percent of the capital city, Port-au-Prince. Airports and seaports were closed for weeks. This affects every, everyone living in Haiti. Okay, I mean, even if you are not living in Haiti, it would affect you. When we want to go shopping, to get, like, I mean, to bring things home, it's, a, it's not easy. Tuesday, CBS was the only news organization on a relief flight that brought 15 missionaries to the United States and delivered 5,300 pounds of hope in the form of cargo. What are some of the things that people need the most? That's have women noodles and there's a, a peanut butter, things that they can quickly eat. This World War II DC-3 turboplane made several deliveries to Cap Haitian, where the items were separated right in baggage claim and then in Pignon. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to, I'm going to be going to churches and also the communities that people, that partners that we're working from the community, that's why I'm going to distribute them. Despite the ongoing unrest, the passengers I spoke to all say they will soon return because Haiti is home. My goal, like, as I am Haitian, I am glad for the opportunity that I have to study in the U.S., but my goal is to come back and serve my country in spite of all the problems we are having. Normally, this flight will also make a stop in Port-au-Prince, but with the continued unrest, they were not given the all-clear to land. In the studios, Tanya Francois, CBS News, Miami. Former Trump advisor Peter Navarro is now serving his prison sentence at a South Florida prison. Navarro was charged and found guilty after he refused to comply with a subpoena from the House Select Committee that investigated the January 6th attack on the Capitol. CBS News Miami's Yvonne Taylor joins us now with the remarks Navarro made moments before turning himself in. Peter Navarro turned himself in at this federal prison before noon. He tried to avoid having to serve time here. His case went all the way to the Supreme Court but it was unsuccessful. A legal expert explains why. I'm pissed. That's what I'm feeling right now. Peter Navarro did not hesitate to express his frustration about turning himself in Tuesday in Southwest Miami-Dade. An unprecedented assault on the constitutional separation of powers. And that was one of the points he addressed at an improvised press conference at a street mall a block away from the federal prison. Navarro was convicted in September of two counts of contempt of Congress for refusing to testify and provide documents to the committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. He was required to come and testify in front of Congress. They served a subpoena on him and he was asked to appear at a certain date and time and testify, and he did not do that. State and federal prosecutor David Weinstein explained why Navarro's case was not successful at the U.S. Supreme Court. Chief Judge Roberts observed that it wasn't just the fact that he was litigating this issue about executive privilege, but he failed to show up. Navarro failed to testify before the committee. And that's why Chief Judge Roberts said, I'm not going to allow you to stay out while you litigate these other issues. Weinstein says Navarro's case sets a precedent. It's a message that is sent to any other people who would think that they could do the same thing, that you have to be accountable 
for your actions. And in this case, he's being held accountable for his actions. Peter Navarro is scheduled to serve four months in this federal prison starting today. In Southwest Miami Dade, Ivan Taylor, CBS News, Miami. South Florida nightclubs are firing back amid a new midnight curfew Miami Beach is implementing in an effort to curb any spring break chaos from erupting. CBS News Miami's Peter Dench has their reaction and the latest pushback on the citywide initiative. Three South Beach nightclubs decided to challenge a midnight curfew, but a Miami-Dade judge ruled that city officials acted in good faith. And city commissioner Alex Fernandez was very outspoken. We implemented the strictest tools ever implemented to protect life and property from the stampedes, the shootings, the stabbings we've seen in years past. Strong words from Miami Beach City Commissioner Alex Fernandez as the city has imposed a midnight curfew this weekend from 23rd Street South to government cut. These are shared sacrifices we make as a community to protect life and property from the criminality we've seen year after year after year. How do we put a price on an innocent life, on the life of a spring breaker? But the curfew is taking its toll on nightclubs, says the operator of M2. In loss of revenues, you're, you're up to a half a million dollars for just the weekend. The owners of M2, Exchange and Mint Lounge, challenge the curfew. It was really to defend most importantly our employees. They need the income. After COVID, we all suffered, we all struggling. At a hearing, Judge David Miller denied the challenge, saying city officials acted in good faith. The city noticed larger crowds starting Thursday night. And last year during spring break, there were two deadly shootings and nearly 500 arrests. We're grateful to the judge and to the court for our on, uh, understanding um, the importance of this curfew. But we know that this weekend historically has been an issue. And so we are all here collectively to protect that and to make sure that we can do everything that we need to do to protect the public. Ben Cuny represented the nightclubs. This court hearing was really very necessary. What this shows everybody is that government can't just run amok and essentially close down businesses without having some independent review. There's no doubt that the judge and the city of Miami Beach heard that there are businesses, there are lawful members of the community who think this is too extreme. The judge also ruled that the curfew did not cause irreparable harm. The curfew lasts from midnight until 6 a.m. on both Saturday and Sunday nights and is only in effect this weekend. On Miami Beach, Peter Dench, CBS News, Miami. When we come back, the results are in and the stage is set for a presidential rematch in November. The latest on the Florida primaries next. South Florida. This is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Welcome back. I'm Lauren Pastrana. On the election front, no surprise here, former President Donald Trump has taken all 125 of the state's delegates in the Florida primaries. While the presidential race had already been set ahead of primary day, locally we were watching several tight races for key South Florida seats. CBS News Miami's Morgan Reiner is in Surfside with more on the outcomes. It's deja vu in Surfside as Charles Burkett will be back in his seat as mayor. Burkett defeated current mayor Shlomo Danziger in a closely watched race where some residents were looking for change. There's so many things going on right now, but for me it's more important about it. They are planning to put some pedestrian areas, uh, a walk path for the pedestrian. Um, I don't agree with that. In Miami-Dade, more than 16% of registered voters cast ballots. In Broward, it was similar. Supervisor of Elections Joe Scott said 25,000 mail-in ballots were returned. With the cities that are having those municipals, there's a lot more activity, there's a lot more people showing up than we do in the other places. But as far as what we expect the overall turnout to be, overall we're looking at about 15% generally across the board. In Pembroke Pines, voters had growth, traffic, and the future of an incinerator on their minds when they went to the polls, electing Angelo Castillo as mayor. He beat Vice Mayor Ira Sipple and newcomer Elizabeth Burns. In Lauderdale by the Sea, where the sandhole death of seven-year-old Sloan Mattingly compelled candidates to weigh in on hiring lifeguards, voters elected Edmund Malcoon mayor. He grew up here and beat newcomer Ann Marchetti and current commissioner Buzz Oldacre. C3 District 1 went to John Graziano and Broward Republican committeeman Richard DeNapoli beat Kenneth Brenner for seat 4 District 2. 
it's a nonpartisan position, and I've uh, had experience working on the Soil and Water Conservation District as an elected official in a nonpartisan capacity. So I just want to keep our town on the right track, make sure we have the best public safety, fiscal responsibility without raising taxes, without taking on debt, and make sure that we regulate vacation rentals. Morgan Reiner, CBS News, Miami. Faced with 50,000 fewer students, Broward school officials say they must right size the district, and that means some difficult decisions. CBS News Miami's Joan Murray has been looking at the enrollment numbers and has this report from Oakland Park. I love you all. I don't want to hang out here talking about it all the time. Let's just get to the solution. Let's do the work. But the work ahead is long and difficult. The Broward School Board must figure out what to do about 50,000 fewer students. Either reinvent, close, merge, or possibly lease or sell the land schools occupy. We do have too many elementary schools, but we have a few um, too many middle schools, maybe. Lots of ideas floated on reimagining schools. More Montessori, gifted a school district charter school, and board member Brenda Pham favored athletics. We as a community should look to partner with, we have um, beautiful weather down here where people would gravitate to make these sports schools something really um, thrive. No schools were named, but more than 60 are under-enrolled. They are heavily black and Hispanic areas. Some board members want to know why the schools are under enrolled. Others want a deeper dive into the age and background of the schools. They have a rich history uh, that um, is important to certain communities and even if they're significantly under enrolled we cannot we cannot close those type of schools. Community activists said they do not want to be blindsided and urged the board to move slowly. Don't look at closing schools as a way to make quick money on excess property. Don't rush to judgment. Thank Do you. the job right for our children. Thank you. So what happens next? Well, the superintendent said April 16th, he will come back with that formal list in black and white so we will have a better idea on what schools may close, merge, or be transformed. In Fort Lauderdale, Joan Murray, CBS News, Miami. When we come back, we're shining the spotlight on a female trailblazer in Pembroke Park who's helping keep the community safe and setting a powerful example. That's next. From South Florida, this is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Welcome back. I'm Lauren Pastrana. CBS News Miami celebrates Women's History Month by introducing you to a woman who quite literally made our library system what it is today. Her name is Helen Muir. And as CBS News Miami's Hank Tester shows us, she found the loves of her life right here in Miami. A perfect picture of Helen Muir, outgoing, determined, and... She was a lot of fun. She was just, just a bundle of energy and creativity. Miami lawyer Toby Muir is Helen Muir's son. Gets a gleam in his eye when he talks about his mother. She was a very outgoing individual. She loved people. She loved interviewing people. She loved, she never met strangers. But the thing that really, many things endear me to, endear her to me, was Miami USA. Helen Muir, 1953, wrote the first definitive coffee table history of Miami, Miami, USA. A steady seller, she updated it over the years, the Miami story from 1875 right up to the turn of the 21st century. It's still in print. But the newspaper was her, her big love. Pre-World War II, Miami. Helen worked in public relations, lured to Miami after newspaper work in New York State. In Miami, she worked publicizing the Romney Plaza Hotel. Along the way, interviewing Eddie Rickenbacker, Doris Duke, Claire Booth Luce, Errol Flynn, Ernest Hemingway, Alfred Hitchcock, Robert Frost. And then moving back into print journalism, well, not easy for a woman to work on newspapers and radio in those days, Helen did it all. She and fellow journalist Marjorie Stoneman Douglas were lifetime friends. And then in 1944, the death of one of her children. Toby Muir's little sister died in an accident. Her friend Marjorie Douglas persuaded her that she needed to do something and that, that it might be a good thing to memorialize her lost daughter by starting a book collection at the Coconut Grove Library. 
She did a lot with the Cook on the Grove Library. She organized Friends of the Library. Using her newspaper skills, she got the ball rolling to organize and consolidate the hodgepodge of local libraries, first writing in the Miami News column entitled, Why It's Time for a County Library System. The libraries in Miami-Dade were only municipal libraries. They were underfunded, under-equipped, and, and she... Uh, promoted that politically and in every possible way. The end result, today's 50 libraries of the consolidated Miami-Dade public library system. Helen Muir's Miami, USA, a must read for history buffs, and the public library system, Miami-Dade, her legacy, we thank her for that. I'm Hank Tester, CBS News, Miami. And now in Pembroke Park, we are shining the spotlight on the police chief. Roshana Dabney Donovan is a trailblazer on so many levels. CBS News Miami's Naja Sherman traces her journey to where she is today. The new chief of Pembroke Park Police Department, Roshana Dabney Donovan, told us she loves the community, the people she works with, and the people she works for. You often see her out and about connecting with the people she serves. I still feel like this is my purpose. I feel like God has really called me to do this. Chief Roshana Dabney Donovan was born and raised in Miami-Dade County. Earlier in her life, her career goals were a little different. She envisioned herself on the big screen. When I was younger, I wanted to be an actress. I graduated from New World School of the Arts in downtown Miami. Yeah, it's almost like fame, if you remember that TV show. She realized a career in acting really wasn't for her. From there, one thing after another just fell into place. My mom saw an ad in the newspaper for a community service aid in the city of Hallandale Beach. I said, well, I'll go give it a try. You know, let me apply and see what happens. And I actually got the job. She told us in June of 2000, she went into the police academy and graduated in October of that year, becoming the first black female police officer for the city. Worked the road for a couple of years on midnight shift. I absolutely loved it. But that little bug called acting was sitting on my shoulder <laughs> and screaming in my ear. So I figured, where can I go? to express my talent. So Dabney Donovan started working undercover. In 2011, she became a sergeant. In 2015, a captain and retired as captain in 2021. But retirement didn't last for long. And then I got a call uh, a few months later and um, from the town of Pembroke Park and inviting me to come and assist with them opening up a new police agency. Chief Roshana Dabney Donovan has been on the job for about six months now, so she says she's just getting started, but looks forward to a long career as the chief of Pembroke Park Police Department. The chief says in her role, she looks forward to mentoring other officers and helping to pave the way for their future. Naja Sherman, CBS News, Miami. What a career. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, you can stay up to the minute on CBS News Miami for breaking news and weather 24 hours a day. Make it a great one. Thank you.